Excess sugar has an interesting effect on the brain. The hard part to determine is when we actually are in excess because every person is going to have a different threshold. If you're more insulin sensitive, then when you consume sugar, you consume excess carbohydrates, they're going to go to the cells within the tissue because you're going to have appropriate glucose disposal where they can actually absorb. Then you have a person that's insulin resistant, they're going to hit that threshold much quicker, meaning they're going to be hyperglycemic much quicker. But how does this actually impact the brain? Because the frustrating thing is, the primary fuel for the brain is glucose. So the brain runs on glucose. Even when we're on a lower carbohydrate protocol, a fairly large percentage of our brain energetics are running off of glucose. So that almost makes us feel like the more glucose we have, the better the brain would operate. But if we pass that threshold, then we have a negative effect. And I have some analogies to make some sense out of this. Let's go ahead and break it down. So after this video, I want you to check out a company called Natural Heaven. They are a Hearts of Palm pasta, rice, brown rice and white rice, and also now they have Hearts of Palm mash, which is like a mashed potato alternative, which is super cool. So if you are someone that's trying to watch your carbohydrate count and you're still trying to have a little bit of those guilty pleasures now and then, you can absolutely have this stuff. So there's a special link down below for you to check them out and also get some. I definitely recommend that you try the mash right now. It is probably my personal favorite when it comes down to the different products that Natural Heaven has. They have been a sponsor on this channel for a number of years. They are awesome. And that link is down below and a big thank you to them for making all as possible. So one of the things that you have to look at is that a quiet brain, a relaxed brain, is a faster operating brain. Okay, think of it like this. I'm going to have a lot of computer analogies here. If you have your computer running and you have 17 different tabs open, you have four different windows, you're also uploading some stuff to Dropbox, and you're watching Netflix, you're going to have a pretty slow computer, right? Just because it has a lot of energy in it right now and you're demanding a lot of power doesn't mean that the computer works better. Okay, when your brain has too much energy, different regions of the brain don't communicate with each other very well. Okay, our brain operates in a very simple manner. Okay, it's called network stability. And what we want is for the regions of our brain to be able to communicate with one another effectively, just as if you and I were talking and we were in a quiet room and you could comprehend and hear everything I'm articulating. But if it was loud and noisy, like we were in an arcade or something, then it would be a whole different ballgame. You might not be able to extract what I'm saying because that inflammation is there causing this chaos. Okay, speaking of chaos, if you hear noise in the background, it's because I'm filming at home and the kids are eating lunch. So chaos is real. You have to learn to deal with it. Okay, but additionally, what happens is you have a degree of inflammation that can occur within the brain if you are hyperglycemic. Okay. Eating a little bit of sugar isn't just gonna magically make you have an inflamed brain. It doesn't work like that. But if you're reaching the point in which too much sugar is at play, then you have an inflammatory response. So think of that inflammatory response as being noise, static and noise, therefore decreasing what's called that network stability. There was a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care that looked at this. It took a look at diabetic patients that were having a degree of hyperglycemia at a point in time. They found that there were decreases in cognitive function, okay? They had decreases in working memory and also processing speed. So think of it like this. Your working memory is like the RAM in your computer. Okay, so the more RAM that you have, that means you have more available working memory to process different things in the computer or on the computer at a given point in time. If you have more of that working memory taken up, then the computer is not going to operate as well. So you go and you buy more RAM and you expand it. Okay, so if you have a decrease in working memory in your brain because you have too much sugar, that's like me going to your computer and pulling out eight gigabytes of RAM just like that, right? So it can have that powerful effect in a negative fashion. And of course, the processing speed of the brain is just like your processor. If you have a weaker processor, your computer is not going to operate as quick, right? So it's very simple analogies that make sense here. There was also a study that was published in the journal Neurology that took a look at high glucose and it demonstrated that there was a pretty direct, almost immediate decrease in cognition. So what they saw with this is there was a decrease in what's called delayed recall and also memory consolidation, which do kind of work hand in hand. So memory consolidation, if you're, uh, <laughs> we're using computers in the 90s or early 2000s, remember when you used to defrag a computer, defragment? That was kind of like memory consolidation. You'd get more space because you'd consolidate memories. They'd also be easier to access in a cleaner fashion that wasn't, well, fragmented. So I know I compare the brain to a computer a lot, but a lot of times I refer to the brain as the CPU, right? Because it's still operating in a very similar fashion there. And then when you bounce back to network stability, if you look on the other side of things, and this in no way is intended to be, you know, 
advocating for a ketogenic diet in any particular fashion with this video. That's not what I'm trying to get across, but there are interesting studies on lower carb, high fat protocols where sugar and carbohydrates were obviously lower that demonstrated that there were improvements in network stability and the ability for the brain regions to actually communicate with one another. Not just in a reduction of inflammation sense, but in an actual communication pathway, which may have something to do with a complicated thing called histone deacetylase inhibition, which I've talked about in other videos and we don't have to worry about today. In other words, we don't know if it's necessarily the ketones that are doing the work or if it's the absence of so much glucose and less hyperglycemia that's allowing the brain to work a little bit better. So you need to sort of find your number. Now, I will tell you that after a workout, for example, you can probably get away with having more carbohydrates or glucose or sugar without it negatively impacting your brain. On the contrary, if you've been sedentary for a while and you're not actually utilizing that glucose and you have less what is called glucose disposal, then you might run into an issue where even a little bit of glucose or a little bit of sugar rather is going to kick you over that edge. So now you have an understanding of how this potentially affects your brain, but know that none of this is causative. Okay, a lot of it is correlation. We have to look at all these different pieces. We only know the tip of the iceberg and we're always gonna only know the tip of the iceberg because that's how science works. I'll see you tomorrow.